Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again for making time today. I know we've, we've all kind of gotten tired of the Zoom meetings um, and gazillion webinars, but uh, so in you again. Um, my name is Radhika. I'm going to be facilitating today. I'd like to introduce our two um, panelists today, and I want to thank uh, them for their generosity um, for uh, making a second appearance in our webinar series today. Um, so the first panelist is um, Laurel, um, and in, in no particular order, but Laurel, if we can just uh, unmute yourself and also start your video, that would be great. Um, Laurel is a faculty at um, Collaborative for Educational Services. Uh, she holds an EdD in Special Education Leadership, as well as Professional License as a Special Education Administrator. In Massachusetts, she has led um, several public and private secondary school programs for students with disabilities and has worked with more than 20 school districts in Massachusetts. So welcome, Laurel. Thank you so much. Uh, Laurel was also our very first guest in uh, this webinar series way back in September. So uh, really appreciate Laurel's generosity with her time. Second guest is Sandra. Um, Sandy is mom to Craig. Um, she is the Associate Dire Executive Director of Namaskit Group and Director of Family Connections, a family support agency in Greater New Bedford. She has been involved with MFOFC for over 20 years. Uh, first as a parent who attended their leadership series and now as a board member and co-chair of the board. So welcome Sandy and thank you too for uh, your generosity. You were our guest in the January um, webinar in the series. So uh, really appreciate you both making your time and again making um, to be available for us for, for this closing webinar in the series. So in many ways, it's fitting that we are closing the series with uh, two of our former guests, um, because what we've tried to do in the series is to share success stories and um, examples of uh, families practicing person-centered planning and creating person-centered living arrangements or including housing arrangements. So I feel it's fitting that we are closing with our um, the series with a, a conversation um, uh, with our two former guests, but this time we are going to ask them about um, how COVID has affected those uh, living arrangements, those person-centered um, living arrangements that their families have created. So that's why we are here. Um, since we only have two out of the three panelists, I'm guessing we will have some extra time, I'm hoping, um, to actually even just talk about person-centered planning in general. Um, and I wanna open it up to everybody um, to ask questions. So um, I, I think we'll have some time for that. But anyway, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I wanted to kind of, uh, first of all, ask, start with um, both of you, Laurel and Sandy. Um, Laurel, if you wanna go first, um, that would be great about telling um, the, the, uh, the folks here about your family's person-centered arrangement and your son, Elijah, and um, you know, just giving us a little bit of background, painting a picture about his pre-COVID um, living arrangement and life in general. So um, I'm, you know, people may uh, know know or know of Elijah. Um, he's actually 20. What year is it? I can never remember how old my kids are. What what is wrong with me? But um, I, he's 26 or 27. I think he's 27. And and uh, he uh, went through uh, the public school system. In um, he has autism and intellectual impairment. There's a picture of Elijah, and these are two of our uh, kind of COVID activities uh, that I can talk a little bit about. So he was in a community-based program that we designed and advocated for, um, being fully included when he was in the school building up until 22, and then fully included in the community when he was not in the school building, which became more and more a part of his day um, when he was in school. Um, and then at 22, he transitioned into a shared living arrangement with someone who had actually been a longtime paraeducator for him um, for probably 12 years. So I think they started together when Elijah was in seventh grade. And um, he is still Elijah's shared living provider. 
Um, however, as a family, we really enjoy our time with Elijah on a daily basis. And so we really wanted to create a space where um, his shared, Elijah and his shared living provider would be adjacent to or part of our family. So um, we ended up buying an old New England farmhouse, you know, the long where the family added sections as the years went on that actually for a period of about 25 years was the Stavros Center for Independent Living in uh, Amherst. And they had outgrown their building. So we purchased their building and rehabbed it into a place where um, Elijah could live. Ideally, we, uh, uh, in fact, we're kind of in the ideal arrangement. Um, Elijah lives here. Um, Matt has his apartment. And my daughter, has, who is two years older than Elijah, subsequently moved back in with us and she does um, some respite for Elijah and lives here with um, her boyfriend on our second floor. So ideally it's Elijah with a set of four other people who all share in his care, my husband, myself, my daughter and her um, partner, and then Matt, who is the and care living provider. Okay, and um, was that always the arrangement? So before your daughter moved in, did he did he have somebody uh, somebody else to support him, or was he it had? Yep, he had a respite, another family that had done respite for him uh, when he was still in school because we had a, a DESE DDS prevention grant for him, so he would go every other weekend um, for respite to this other family's home, and they had three grown adult children who also shared along with the, the parents in that family, kind of the, the, the care, because Elijah is a person who can't be left alone and he's not always a reliable communicator. Um, and he has had some periods of time where he's been quite aggressive. And that's one of the things that really changed um, our trajectory for him. And um, does he work or did he work pre-COVID? Um, pre -COVID, so while he was still in high school, he was placed with an adult uh, vocational employment vendor. Mm -hmm. um, through ServiceNet, they have a, a farm called Prospect Meadow Farm. And so he was there as a high school student. Um, and then when he turned 22, he transitioned into a paid position there. And it's uh, not full-time, it's a few hours a week? No, it's full-time. He's oh. there 30 hours a week. Um, although while he's there, um, because of the nature of his ability and availability for work, not every hour that he spends in uh, at the vocational program is a work hour, is a paid work hour. Okay, so he receives some sort of support on the job, basically. Uh, yeah, he has... Uh, you know, it's interesting, right? I think perhaps all of Elijah's arrangements, both the day and the residential, are different on paper than they are in reality. Um, mm. So I think on paper, he has one-to-one -one support. Okay. And in reality, he, he doesn't- We don't want it. We, okay. You know, in reality, what we like doing with Elijah is having his resources be integrated into a community of people and shared. Mm -hmm. um, knowing that if, if, his, um, if he becomes aggressive or unavailable, someone can, is able to go with him. But if he doesn't need that and can be functioning as part of the community or part of the group, we prefer that. So it sounds like a degree of flexibility. In, yeah, in the, yeah. I, I, will, I will have to say that um, the Department of Developmental Services and our vendors, Nonatuck and ServiceNet, have been tremendously flexible with us and have understood both the kind of the level of need that Elijah can present with and the fact that his profile can change um, on an hourly basis. <laughs> so it's, it's really been, we have an amazing team. And Matt has been with uh, you guys for how long? Matt started as the school para when Elijah was in seventh grade. Wow. So probably 15 years now. Okay, a long with time Elijah. Elijah. Not with us, 15 years with Elijah. Okay, and he's he is he married or he's no, of, you okay. know, <laughs> Matt. Matt is a uh, okay. a free spirit, or um, <laughs> he works as a para, still has his para educator job and works with other students. He's a certified um, special educator, um, but he chooses he prefers to be in the direct support role. Okay, great. Um, thank you. And uh, Sandy, why don't you go ahead and tell us about Craig? I have sure. A few um, photos here. So I'm going to talk about my son, Craig. Um, Craig is 33 years old and 
um, he, be, before COVID, you know, he has been living in a home. He's been living out of our family home for going on six years. Um, so when he was around 26 is when he had the opportunity to move out and he has a roommate. It's a three bedroom house. Um, the roommate's downstairs and he has the entire upstairs. So he has his uh, bedroom, uh, bathroom, and what we call his man cave. And he spends a lot of time up there uh, doing what 30 year old guys do, <laughs> playing video games and uh, watch movies. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's the yellow uh, houses where he lives. And it's in a, a wonderful small town uh, called Fairhaven. Mm -hmm but it, it's small and he's right in the middle of downtown so across the street is a post office on the corner is a library and on the other side is the town hall and then they can actually walk around and there are some you know quaint little restaurants and stores around the village we call it mm -hmm. um, and so he has been there and it's t it's taken time you know mm -hmm. I started um, working on a plan or person center plan um, probably right when Hold on. Probably I'm right ready. when he was, um, before he left school, you know, mm -hmm. we knew that um, as a family, that one of the objectives was, is to start planning as early as possible because he would need a lot more time and a lot more uh, availability to be able to work on skills so he could move out and that he felt comfortable, he knew what he wanted and we could also feel comfortable knowing he was in a safe place. Um, with Craig, uh, it, he has a combination of supports. I knew that I could not um, probably get enough funding to cover him 24 hours a day through the Department of Developmental Services. So even as of right now, he has a combination of um, DDS hours and we use his PCA hours. And he also, he and his roommate will uh, share like overnights and so forth. So we don't have two staff in the house. There's one staff that stays overnight and a lot of times in the, you know, early evening, you know, around dinner time, there'll be one staff because both guys don't really want to go out, um, especially in the winter time. Um, so, you know, it, again, one of the things I can't stress enough is it's never too early to start planning, but it's also never too late. You know, it's wherever and whenever it's, people are comfortable in doing so, um, you know, uh, I think it's important to look at every, you know, unique family situation. Um, our family went through a lot of change when we were, we were younger, um, when Craig was younger, uh, from divorce to some medical needs of our own. So that we knew at that time the planning had to start, but for other families, you, it's never too late to plan any time. Mm -hmm. And you said he works, right? He works part-time? Yes, Craig has been working from the age of 16 um, mm -hmm. on part-time, various things. He started out at a uh, company, it's called um, uh, Lockheed Martin, and, and you might've heard of that around the world. He started there um, and it was a magnificent way of starting. He was, um, um, he was medically involved with a trach at that time, so he didn't have any uh, voice, but he was a, uh, duplicating operator or something and they give it a whole title but it was secretive where you had to have clearance to be in this part of the um the organization and because i would tell him all the time well he can't speak so he can't give the information out right <laughs> it worked he now currently works at a place it's um it's at like a furniture store in our local area they have a few furniture stores and he works there part-time usually craig we figured out through the years, between 10 and 15 hours a week is enough for him. He wants mm -hmm. spending money, but he doesn't you know, want to be there on a full-time basis. That's just not his cup of tea. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, he, uh, for how long has his uh, support uh, professionals known him or been with him? Well, it's, it's again a combination. He has one uh, support person who's been with him, as Laurel said, with um, uh, Elijah, probably since they, he was in high school. And she still is with him. Mm -hmm. um, and she uh, actually even does some PCA hours where we started years ago trying to give Craig the opportunity to be away from the family um, gradually. So we did a transition and she would take him on Tuesdays and he would uh, sleep over her house. She's, you know, has a boyfriend, they're getting married, uh, older woman, but uh, my age, that's not so older. Um, and he still to this day sleeps over her house except during COVID, he couldn't go, but 
Um, he's still every Tuesday and, and that's a thing for him. He, he does that. And she also provides supports during the week. And then mm -hmm. other, he's very, very close to a, a young man and they have been together since probably a year after he moved in, they hired Chris, his name is, and it's perfect. Chris has the same interests as he does. Um, this, the same, uh, you know, when they go out they're they're with a group of friends of Chris's and they'll go out to, uh, wrestling matches and uh, concerts and uh, restaurants. Um, so that's been a great opportunity for him to have somebody close to his age with the same interest to also share with him. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like uh, both of you have, or your kids have um, had some long-term, um, I mean, relationships with these direct support providers. So that, seems, that sounds like a, definitely a blessing um, because it maintains some continuity. So let's let's get to uh, why we're here, which is, tell me, um, how did COVID, um, I mean, when, when the whole thing, you know, started, like in March, uh, how did that um, affect you? And what were your big concerns at that time? Uh, Laurel, you want to go first? Um, you know, I am definitely um, a product of my uh, my maternal family. So I would say, uh, as, as is typical in our uh, life journey, it affected uh, my husband and I very differently. And Elijah is um, a person who doesn't um, speak much and who doesn't, so we have no idea what his thoughts are about it other than that um, anything that disrupts his routine or his schedule causes him a lot of anxiety, which then can result in behaviors that are um, dangerous for himself mm -hmm. and for other people. Um, he's six foot three inches tall and he weighs over 300 pounds and he can let you know that what is happening does not fit with his plan. And so that was one of, I think my concern was that, knowing that what he likes to do is go to work at, his, at this day program, go to the gym every day and swim and work out and go out to eat like that. That is, that's what rocks his world. Um, and so I, I had concerns about that. My husband has um, more concerns about health and safety. We do not have risk factors in our immediate family. And my husband works for the Berkshire County Arc as their clinical director. And my daughter and her boyfriend who live in the house work for uh, the state in uh, state operated group homes. And Matt works in the school as a para. And so like all of us are in these kind of similar caretaking roles. And so everyone had different um, concerns about COVID itself. But for me, mm. it was mostly the schedule. Mm. And what about you, Sandy? Um, uh, again, I, I alluded to it before. Craig has a complex medical history, put it that mm. Um, when he was a, um, actually entering middle school, he um, developed strep throat and it ended up, um, he aspirated it into his lungs and he had uh, bacterial pneumonia. And for, you know, uh, around six years, he was in and out of the hospital. He ended up having a trachostomy to breathe and he did not have a, um, any airway above the trachostomy. Um, and he had two tracheal uh, reconstructive surgeries during that time. So my biggest concern always is his exposure to people of any type of sickness. Um, you know, the, the, the Mass General is, is very clear that if he were to get sick again, such as anything in the lungs, um, if he were trached, he would never not be trached again, meaning they can't do reconstruction mm. longer because they're already taking, you know, a, a part of his trach out to uh, twice to try to um, reverse it, which they were successful doing. So my biggest concern is always, I'm always talking to him and the staff, how you feel, especially flu season. Are you sick? Do you feel like this? Um, and so when we did hear about COVID, and it's funny, you know, everybody goes through different situations. My boyfriend and I had had a, um, a fire in the house the weekend after Thanksgiving. And we were actually had to relocate well, our, our house was being uh, uh, mm. fixed. So the night that we moved back here, March 15th is the night I picked up Craig and the night that he stayed and had never went back. <laughs> so unfortunately, Craig didn't even have a bed when he got here. I was like, oh damn, we got to put this stuff together. 
Um, but we were able to do so. And again, you know, my precautionary measures are always for his health first. And um, again, Craig's understanding. I talked to him a lot about the um, virus, but it's hard because you don't really see it. You just hear about it. Um, but I, I, as much as I could say that he understands, he he does now that I'm, you know, he sees people wear masks. He knows that you have to wear it. Um, he, he does hear me all the time saying, I, it's been, so you don't get sick, so you don't go back to the hospital. And he does remember that. So you mentioned that he didn't leave after March 15th. So, it, so he, that means he didn't go back to his living arrangement. Not until last week. Yes. So, so why, why was that? Why, why did he not get to go back home? Um, again, uh, when, when, when the state the part, Department of Developmental Services was very clear that if a family member went and picked up their son or daughter that was living in another arrangement, whether it be a group home, whether it be uh, individual supports in their own home or some combination of that, that had any DDS hours, that you could not bring them back. You take them mm. back, come back. And mm. until this was over or until they had other steps to take. So currently what the step is right now is that the individual has to be tested, everybody in the home, including staff, and if they have any roommates or other living uh, companions. Uh, and um, once that goes through, then there can be a transition back. But knowing that, the caveat to that is he can't, I can't go pick him up. I can't take him out. Um, I can go and visit in the lawn and he can be up on the deck. So quite a distance. Uh, I can't go into his home. Um, and so those are some of the, the, the steps that DDS had taken to keep everyone safe. But now that things are opening, that's another topic that's being brought up by family members, including myself. It's like, he can go out and get a haircut and go to the restaurant with staff. He can go shopping, but he, I can't. Take mm. And I was tested as well. Um, and again, to me, it's a snapshot in time, as well as any staff member that's around him. You're tested, but who knows what happens in the next one, two months afterwards, whether you're exposed again. Mm -hmm. So so when you, um, you know, when he came home mid-March and he's been with you, you said he, he left uh, a week ago. Um, what happened to the support then for him uh, during that time? That well, that with you. Sure. I mean, that again was a, a, a big topic for many families that were in the similar boat as ours. Um, it has to be, it had to be a personal choice with each family. And again, this is, you know, why we have to look at each individual. And I hate guidelines that um, impact everyone the same way rather than looking at them as an individual. Um, and so, um, we were not comfortable, myself and my boyfriend and Craig. Um, to have other staff come to our home and do anything with them. Some families did, some families chose to do so. Um, so what, what ended up happening, um, which again is a, something I think the next time around, if we get into this predicament again, DDS has to think of other ways to support families that take their loved ones home, um, is that we were fortunate enough to be able to use his PCA hours eventually, I didn't at first, but it, it then covered me supporting him at home because I'm not his guardian. He's his own guardian. And so I was able to, because they weren't being used by anybody at all, use some of those hours toward him staying here. And again, it helped with the extra food, the extra electricity, the extra everything that comes upon having him here. And again, um, each family is different and unique. If you live in a group home, you don't have PCA hours. So that wouldn't be an option. And DDS, never did figure out how to convert any hours to help a family that had to take them home. If it was DDS hours, they did not figure that out. Um, so many families went home and are still home with their loved ones and have no financial resources whatsoever to help. And, but you said you have, you were able to use the PCA hours. Mm -hmm. uh, was that an easy process to kind of get it to switch to you? Um, it was. Um, I, again, it wasn't too difficult. You know, you had to do the paperwork that as you would hire any new PCA, submit it to uh, Tempest, you know, your W-4 and, you know, copies of your, you know, license, but in all the different paperwork necessary. 
Um, but again, it was due to the fact that I, no one is his guardian. Um, and um, so techni technically I could be his PCA at any time. Um, mm. He's home um, because I, I don't think it's necessary. And I think he needs to be around people that he wants to like staff Lee and other staff that use his PCA hours. Um, but while he was here, it did come in handy. It really did. Uh, you know, I don't, he hasn't been home with me in a, a number of years, you're six years. So I forgot how much he eats and how much <laughs> he takes a shower and everything else that he does. Um, so it definitely was helpful and useful. Um, you know, it mm -hmm. wasn't before seven, nor would I ever, he's my son, but with a lot of families financially, they can't do it alone. And so we really need to think of another way to support them when, when and if this happens again with a pandemic or anything else. Mm. All right, thank you, Sandy. So Laurel, why don't you tell us, I know yours is a, a more kind of a, a less of a structural change because he is kind of literally under your roof, but tell us how your take on how it changed uh, things um, in the living arrangement and support. Well, I think the biggest change is um, that he doesn't, he's, he's with us all the time, you know, so he's here now all day. Um, uh, Where did Matt go? Um, Matt's still here, but so it's interesting the way we have um, understood and worked in the uh, shared living model, which is designed to be a very flexible model. So it can be one provider or two providers or a group of providers, according to what we've been told by our regional director and by the people we know at uh, Central, at DDS Central. Um, and so that's how we've understood it. So Matt has an apartment. Um, a two bedroom apartment that's attached to our house and has an interior door that mm -hmm. Matt can lock so that we can't get in. But um, Elijah's bedroom is actually on our side of the uh, house. So Elijah sleeps on our side. He does have the second bedroom in Matt's side. Um, he doesn't choose to use it. He could, um, but he doesn't choose to. And so the big change is that Elijah doesn't go out during the day and that Elijah doesn't um, all of the activities that kept, kept him busy and regulated um, are not an option. Really the only thing he can do now is go out for walks or um, now that it's nice and some of the state parks have opened, we can take him to um, swim at the lake. But otherwise um, we are here at home. And so Elijah has started doing chores like laundry and taking out trash and emptying the dishwasher. Um, he cleans, he'll clean the counter. He helps me clean the bathroom. I don't let him do it alone. Um, and he uh, will help to water the flowers. Um, so so it's we've shifted more into that to helping him do more. He does not like vacuuming. He will not touch the vacuum and wants nothing to do with it. Although he's happy to listen. It's not, not the sound. I think it's more the effort, like the pushing of it. Um, that is not his fave. Um, and he paints. That was the, the picture that you showed earlier. He was actually asked by the Berkshire County Arc to paint um, a painting for their restrooms so that when they open up, they have visual reminders about um, hand washing. So mm -hmm. we made two different paintings, one for the women's room and one for the men's room. Um, so, so those are the things that he does. Um, he did, he used to use an iPad a lot when he was in school and then kind of when he was out farming and being busy in the community, we moved away from it. Um, and now he's back, he's back to Googling and you know, looking mm -hmm. up things that he likes and looking at YouTube clips. Um, which is nice. It's a skill that he hasn't lost, even though he hasn't really used it for about the past five years. And you decided to separate Matt and him because just purely for safety reasons. No, no, no. Mostly for Matt. <laughs> uh. I mean, to be, to be honest, so I'm a big person who believes that when you have people in your circle and they're sharing care with your family, it has to work for everyone. Mm. So everyone has to get what they want. Like my daughter moved back in. We have a downstairs bedroom. I'm sitting in it right now but um you know in order to give her some privacy and some space we just moved her into our upstairs which is not finished and it's not heated and it's you know there's a lot of knots um but it you know it, it, everybody has to have what they need hmm. and when will um so i should mention both elijah and uh craig didn't work during the past uh because the employment kind of stopped um 
And is Matt paying rent to you guys, uh, Laurel, or like? Yeah, okay. That's part of our um, arrangement because it and and it's interesting. The reason for the rent for having Matt be a renter <laughs> um, is that um, it gives us a gives us a relationship with Matt that allows everyone to feel safe and confident about the nature of the relationship. Mm -hmm. And. So, uh, right. That's another thing, you know, when you do shared living and yeah. it's so weird and kind of flexible and open, it's just good to have boundaries mm -hmm. that are clear and um, can be navigated if problems arise. And uh, so he's still paying rent. And then when is the next, I guess, when, when would things get back to kind of pre-COVID, almost pre-COVID? Is that no, a plan? For all of us, we don't know because of the nature of our work. Right, Matt might be, right. I know Matt's remote all summer. He's a para and they are only doing remote education this summer, okay. um, much as he would love to be back out. Um, and, you know, uh, Chris and I are both working here at home right now. Elijah's at home. Um, Sarah and her boyfriend work overnights. But you don't know when Matt would come back to uh, being uh, Elijah's support provider i mean he does matt does do hours with him elijah's out with matt right now walking mm -hmm. um, okay but but the, the the dilemma for the two of them is what do they do yeah. mm -hmm. you know because nothing's open there's nowhere to go they can't go to the all their routines and you know matt as much as elijah is a creature of routine matt is too mm -hmm. like he is not a we don't go wing it guy mm -hmm. you know he used to transport elijah to and from work too right um, he, uh, so our, our, our vendor, our human services vendor will transport Elijah to and from work. Matt will transport him locally, but not in any unfamiliar routes. Like again, Matt is a very kind of, I do what I know and I don't do new things. So we often will pick them up and drive them if it's a new place or a farther from our house place. Mm -hmm. um, and then Matt and Elijah both qualify for ADA transportation. And so they will use that together. I see. What is ADA transportation? Uh, it's paratransit, senior transit. It's oh, okay. people who cannot. So Elijah can ride a bus, uh, a regular public PBTA, public transit bus, um, when he is well. Um, and when he is not well, um, it would be an exciting ride. And so... <laughs> So that's how he ended up qualifying for paratransit. He doesn't have a physical disability, mm. um, but he has a behavioral disability. And we were able to get documentation of that. So he has door-to-door -door van transportation provided by the paratransit company because we live within three quarters of a mile of a bus stop. Cool. And um, so Sandy, what about uh, Craig? Uh, he didn't work during the uh, the the past two three months yeah. and you said he's back now in his home so tell us about that like what's the it, is he back at work um he hasn't gone back to work yet the furniture store that he works at um only opened up i think the first phase where they were allowed to start opening was a couple of weeks ago um so during this whole covid he didn't have a choice about work either because it was closed due to the covid um so you know we're starting to discuss it as a group talking about when and if he can go back. And again, some of the questions we're asking is, how busy is the store? Um, how are other people, the, the other um, personnel there, are they wearing masks all the time? And it's those, you know, those we're starting to question when it's going to be a good time for him to go. Um, he, he is fortunate with the work that he does. He does a lot of the pricing. And so that's sort of on the side in the back room, um, not away from customers altogether, but on the side. Um, so it could definitely be something we're looking at having happen. It's so hard. I mean, it's like any family right now with this COVID, I don't care where you are in the world to, to decide if and when, you know, even deciding if and when he went home, it really came to the fact that, you know, it, it, Craig really needed to go back for, his own sanity and his own health. You know, he was literally in a, you know, what, eight by 10 room practically. It was our spare room. Um, none of his personal belongings are here because I've, I've been living with my boyfriend for um, four years. 
So he just has a, a, a spare room that he occasionally would come over around holidays and every so often when, you know, he wanted to get away for a weekend type thing. So it was important, more important that he got back to his home so he had more space and he could do more things. Again, like many other people, I have to work full time and I do. So even though he was here, I would run and the office is downstairs in our house. I would only go upstairs during the day, make sure he had breakfast, make sure he had lunch, make sure he had dinner. Other than that, he was on his own. <laughs> you know, I couldn't entertain him. I couldn't take him out. I couldn't even take a walk with him because I, you know, if I find that working from home, I work more now than I ever did when I was in the office. I really need to turn this around again. <laughs> um, so, you know, and again, there's no right time. You know, I keep on saying, well, let's just see if the numbers go up again. Um, but I also know that we can't stay locked up in our homes forever either. Right. All the precautionary measures as possible. Mm -hmm. That we, you know, life has to take a chance. Now, one thing I forgot to ask, does um, Craig rent or own the home? He rents and he does have a section eight um, that finally, he, when he first moved in around six years ago, I had put in his uh, section eight application for a federal section eight where it's a voucher and he can go anywhere in the United States and have this apply to where he lives. Um, and he only got on the list and got uh, okayed for this about, um, or between four and five years ago. So the first year he didn't have anything to help him with his rent. Um, so now he does. But even during COVID when he was here with me, he still had to pay rent. You know, he's like anybody else where if you moved out of your house and you still want to go back there and you don't own it, you still got to pay rent. Or if you don't, you know, if you own it, you still got to pay mortgage, even if you're not there. Um, so he still had to pay his rent. Um, so I guess, um, biggest what what did you guys learn from the whole what did the whole past three months teach you about i mean were you glad you had the arrangements um the way they are right now did it reveal any new learnings for you any new gaps that you weren't aware of did you learn about any new resources you can take advantage of uh, what were the takeaways for you guys if any in the for, that covid revealed wants to go. Yeah, I'll let Laurel go first. <laughs> um, I, you know, I would say, so one of the great take advantages of what was Elijah's flexibility right now. Um, and we are chalking that up to a combination of divine intervention <laughs> and a lot of um, support. Um, I, I have no idea why, but of all the people in our household, Elijah has been the most flexible and found all these changes the easiest to roll with. Hmm. Um, sometimes he does want to talk about um, everyone being sick, right? Everyone's sick, which basically for him means he can't go to the movies, he can't ride horses, he can't go out to eat, he can't go to the gym, um, he can't swim in the pool. Um, so, so, so I think discovering his flexibility and also honestly, some of the stuff that he does independently, I'm like kicking myself. Why, 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 why didn't I make him responsible for the laundry before? Because he does it a hundred percent independently. Like he puts the detergent, he does a better job at it than my daughter, right? Who, who doesn't have the kind of cognitive profile that Elijah has. Like he's very meticulous with the how much detergent and how much, you know, softener. He's probably better at it than I am, honestly, because he pays attention to it. Um, and the same with like emptying the dishwasher or cleaning. If I give him a cleaning task, it is done beautifully. We cleaned every window in our house. I, I was like, why, 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 why didn't I ever ask him to do this stuff? Hmm. Um, so that would be the other one. Hmm. I wonder, so did you, do you have a new routine? Does he have a different routine at home? like than the previous obviously he had work before but now it's like have you guys created a new routine we're because terrible at, at like okay. this is the problem right we have a kid with autism and we know my husband's a bcba right <laughs> like we know visual schedules right routines blah, blah blah do you think we do that no we don't we don't do any of that we're terrible we're the worst I, i'm wondering if, there, if i'm asking because sometimes 
maybe that new, if he did have a new routine, maybe that's opened up that flexibility, you know, ability. Would love, flexibility would love to say that, but no. That's freed him up in some way. <laughs> okay. Uh. Um, he just, I don't know why. I honestly think that his um, psychiatric medications are very good. And um, we all understand his, com his way of communicating, right? Which is, I think, important. Um, because he doesn't communicate in a way that it can be easy for unfamiliar people to understand. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, like, I don't know, divine intervention. He's involved. definitely spending more time with his parents. Oh, yeah. Family. That's more that's time funny. at home. Like he, I would never, yeah. I, if when he was three years old, if I had had to be at home with him like this, someone would have not survived. I, like it would have, like, there was no way. Um, because he was busy all the time and, and, uh, you know, but now we can all be here and he can do things independently that I just never would have thought. Um, great. Sandy, what's any takeaways for takeaways you? Takeaways is it's more me personally, how much I miss him and even my boyfriend, um, and, and I think this as a mom, I will honestly say, is it's always been so hard for me right from when he was young and, and I said he needs to go on a regular bus and re instead of the special ed bus or he needs to go to early intervention at such an early age or, um, you know, uh, his being included throughout the years and being part of the group and, and everything that goes with that, the good and the bad. Um, as a mom, I want to protect and I want to take them and just hold them and, and make sure nobody get comes near them that's sick and nobody takes them away. But on the other side, he pushes me every day to give him independence. And when and I see that by how he reacts when he goes home. I, I don't I don't get to go with him, but um, I was I was uh, mentioned to Radhika just before we got on that um, he got an, a new iPad while he was here and. He texts me all the time now. <laughs> Again, it's his vocabulary. He, he has figured out on the iPad, you can put letters and it predicts words and he puts it together. But between my, myself and my, uh, one of my daughters who lives uh, uh, a couple miles away from me and um, Craig's an uncle, so, and she's expecting again in another couple months. I'm like, did Craig text you last night? Yep, midnight he texted me too. <laughs> You know, and that just, it's so rewarding, too, to be able to see that it works and that he's happy. And I've been fortunate to really meet so many families here in Massachusetts and in other parts of the, the country as well that um, it's the hardest for the parents to do this. Um, and things aren't perfect. Don't get me wrong. There are plenty of times where, you know, it didn't work out or we have to say, well, this isn't the right uh, opportunity for him because he's obviously showing us. But when it does work, oh, it feels so good. And I'm seeing it, so I'm part of it. And it's not happening, and unfortunately, a lot of, a, a lot of us would want to do this. And I honestly would love to say, well, he stayed with me forever, and then when I died, so somebody took care of him. Um, because then I wouldn't have to see the ups and downs and missing him so much. Um, but I also know that I can't do that. It's like, I can't with my daughter either. You know, even my grandson, my, my, um, my daughter is, you know, she's trying to give me some limitations on that. <laughs> you know, so I think it's just that um, wonderful opportunity to spend more time with him. But I also know, yes, have his own life. So, but you, you've told, uh, you've shared before that you, from his very young age, you were very adamant about that, creating that vision and involving mm -hmm. him in that vision. And he, how adamant he was from a young age about wanting that independence, mm -hmm. uh, where you mentioned, you know, your, his, his sisters wanted to, would want to stay with him and he, he would be like, no, that's okay, I, I can do it. So just that, I, get, I guess he feels empowered uh, mm -hmm. because of all that pre, that legwork you did uh, when he was younger. Um, in developing that vision and it, making him a very active participant in, yes. in that development. I, I kind of, that's my sense. Yes. Um, okay, great. Now I see a ton of stuff on the, um, yeah. on the chat. Um, 
I guess everybody can, I can read it up. What kind of accommodations and supports have you found DDS or Medicaid offer for medically complex um, people and where do you find your support people? And I, I see Laurel's answer that, um, uh, let's see, trying to decide when time is right to stop claiming daughter as dependent on taxes and does this affect any DDS support housing? Um, sounds like some good advice, Laura, looking for help. Uh, Sandy, did you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, let me go back to that question again. What was the question again? So um, one is, what kind of accommodation and supports have you found DDS or Medicaid offer for medically complex people? And the mm -hmm. other one was trying to decide when time is right to stop claiming daughter as dependent on taxes and does this affect DDS support? Housing. The first question with the medica medically complex, um, they can still qualify for the medically complex areas of need, such as when Craig was younger and he was medically involved, he um, did receive the case management uh, from UMass and we did have additional PCA and nursing hours. So that still could be in place if he needed it. He doesn't need it at this time. Um, but that definitely, I've seen many people able to go on and have a different living arrangement from their family and still receive the supports they need in that area. Um, so that is definitely something that can occur. And the only thing that it would do for DDS quote hours is probably give you a higher priority where you would probably be set to get some of those services sooner than others that don't have such a need. Um, so I would not have that as a hold up. I mean, I had planned even if Craig's reconstructive surgeries weren't working, we were still on that path to have him move out and to be independent, even if he did require the nursing hours that he did when he did have his trait. Um, again, it's developing relationships with your staff, you know, whether it be, he had a lot of the same nurses for many years as well, because we gained trust and he gained trust with them and it worked out. Um, and the second about the uh, claiming, everyone's different. Um, even though Craig is living in his own home, I could still claim him on my taxes because I contribute, um, if, you, if you contribute more than 50% to have them live in another arrangement, you could still claim them. And the other thing also to know is even if you don't claim them, and um, that's possible as well. Um, he still is under my health insurance, even though he doesn't live. Right. And so that's his primary health insurance. It's insurance that I have. And secondary is his mass health Medicaid. And due to that, there's a, um, a health insurance premium program that the state, depending on how much you pay for your health insurance, will reimburse you for that amount. So that still occurs. So the only people that are on my health insurance right now is myself being employed and Craig. My other daughters have grown, one's married, the other one's on her own, um, you know, um, I divorced, so the ex is off mine too. <laughs> so that is another thing to, to remember that that can continue as, it doesn't matter if they live with you or not. Okay. Um, there was another question. Sandra, was anything special done so that Craig received a Section 8 in only four years? My son's been waiting nine years. Yeah. He didn't receive it in four years. We put in the application when he was 18. It didn't come up until four years ago. So what happened was, and it's very similar, you know, um, the Section 8 voucher that we applied for, the one that he can go anywhere, which he tells me all the time he's moving to Hawaii. And he really could because he has Section 8 that will apply there if he wanted to. Um, is that if you apply for a local Section 8 at a housing authority, you're, you can actually get that apartment or, or a home or whatever they have in a much quicker process. It could happen within a year or two. But you have to stay within that housing authority. You can't go wherever you want. And so I knew putting him on the Section 8 voucher for the federal voucher would require a longer wait period. And in average, when you apply at 18, um, people will start getting off the wait list and getting the Section 8, usually late 20s, early 30s. So it does take fun. There's only so many of the federal government issues every year, and there's only so many that you know, are up for grabs, like somebody doesn't need it any longer or passes. 
Um, so that is a normal wait period. I'm so sorry. you apply as early as you can, and the earliest you can apply is 18. 18. Okay. And um, you're applying for your, your loved one themselves as uh, head of household, meaning that when I, I helped Craig fill out that form, it had nothing to do with his family at all. It had only to do with him and his income and what his needs were. And even with that, I, I was able to uh, say on the form that he required a, at least a two bedroom because he needed to have staff with him. And you have to be employed to apply for it? No. No. Okay. Because right. the other income that all, many of our sons and daughters have is sub some type of um, supplemental, whether it be a supplemental um, security, SSI, or social security disability. Mm have an income. And that's, to me, a much more uh, reliable income than other ways because they get it every month and they're not going to disqualify unless all of a sudden they became rich or didn't have a good special needs trust put in place. Mm -hmm. um, great. Thank you, San Sandy and uh, Laurel. So any other questions? I mean, I do have a few here that we got in advance. So um, if you have any more questions, just unmute yourself and ask or um, type it, um, and then I can, while we wait, I can kind of look at the ones we've got via email. Um, how does one deal with res respite time during this pandemic? Um, any programs and respite places are closed. Caretakers and parents need a break. Well, you know, I thought about that for a while. And um, again, it really depends on each family situation. Um, what I have seen occur, and again, I didn't use that with Craig, but I have seen it in the work that I do, is that families really needed and required that. For instance, uh, a family caregiver was a sister and she had her, her brother with her. And she had planned going to Florida for a particular reason, which she couldn't get out of or wanted to do any, anyway. And so it was brought to our attention that she needed somebody to care for him. So the first uh, thing that I do with families is ask, do you have any other family members that could do it? You might feel more comfortable with someone you know who, where they've been and who they've been around. Um, if they say they don't have anyone, I say, do you have a family friend? Again, my premise behind that is it depends on how comfortable you are. You know, Because you worry about the social distancing exactly. and, and all of that. Yeah. Yes, but mm -hmm. it's not impossible. So I see things opening up now we are, we're starting to get more requests where people are feeling more comfortable in saying, you know, maybe we can look for our respite provider and see if they want to do it again. And families are comfortable knowing that maybe they haven't become ill and can talk to them and see whether they've been keeping social distance from others. So it's when people are comfortable. So it's not impossible. It's just that, um, you know, the respite programs, I think they close. For respite providers, they didn't close. They're still, they still exist. Okay. Yeah, I, I actually agree. It's a great opportunity to ask people who are in your circles <clears throat> of relationship to um, do something that they enjoy with that, that might be mutually enjoyable. So it's kind of a nice, it's nice to be able to say, listen, we used to have respite or we used to access a respite house. Would you be willing? We have some friends who are, um, have uh, spouses and partners who are dependent on them for care. And we've been kind of cycling in and out to help them out. Um, also, I think in addition to your comfort and, and feelings about safety, um, reaching out to people who will in the near future be in your, mm -hmm. in the circles. So uh, people who work at day programs or day habs mm -hmm. or work in residential settings that your child's connected with or work in, um, like a, for Elijah, if I needed someone, I would contact the gym and say, hey, he's been going there for 10 years. Who's working for you now that knows him? Could I talk to that person? Because most people are in those positions are looking for some hours and some extra income right now. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like a, you know, a nice yeah. time to talk to the wider group of people um, about it. And oftentimes people will do it and you can barter something. Like if you don't have the resource of PCA hours or we don't have PCA hours because Elijah's in shared living. We have a, a, a respite package and that's pretty much allocated. But um, sometimes people will be like, yeah, you know, maybe if I could borrow your car or maybe if you would fill my tank with gas or maybe, you know, stuff like that. 
Um, the other question I had was, if I choose not to send my daughter back till there's a vaccine, are there consequences for refusing what DDS offers as programs and housing options reopen? Right now, I would say you're not going to be affected because we don't even have a state budget passed yet. Um, so what's actually occurring here in the state of Mass is that um, provider agencies and services for any individuals under a contract with the Department of Developmental Services is being started at half this year. Um, meaning that if you, instead of a full fiscal year would start, start July 1st to June 30th, it's, it starts July 1st, but you only plan for a half year budget. Mm. They don't ha have any clue of what the state budget is gonna look like yet. Um, and, and so if you choose not to go back in to something that's being offered, um, Again, make sure you put something in writing that, that everyone is agreed upon that it will not affect them. You'd be surprised how much authority families and individuals mm -hmm. still have. I think as adults, though, we forget that. It's, some, you know, it's similar to school. You have a lot of authority mm -hmm. and uh, you need to use it when you need to use it. And so I would advise you know, putting something in writing that you're not comfortable yet due to the COVID. This is in place or this is being offered we, but know that it has to stay there, remain there until we open up more or it becomes safer or whatever it be. Yeah, I actually forwarded the questions you sent, um, Radhika, to a friend of ours who works at the central office for the Department of Developmental Services, which by the way, everybody who is engaged in the system should have friends in those places. <laughs> you should know, have a personal contact with people at DDS Central, as well as at your regional office and your area office. Um, that often get makes the, the process of partnering a little easier and a little less um, frightening. Um, so I did send the questions off and I got um, responses. Um, and the response that I got was, it's really important if you choose not to send someone back or choose not to take advantage of a service that's offered to be in co active communication with both your service coordinator and the area office, meaning the assistant or, or area director. Um, and, and that's because DDS does is doing actively planning and um, conveying to their vast network of people um, that there needs to be flexibility in order to be responsive to the readiness and comfort level of individuals and families as they re-engage in services. And that and DDS is aware that they need to have more flexibility about alternatives and options. It's just that the infrastructure doesn't exist yet. And also um, when you are conveying messages to large groups of people, the messages can be inconsistent, right? And so I'm gonna grab the... Um, so I guess the message is keep came back. I just came back and they're all processing the. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so that's, you know, I think that that's really, um, for us has been really essential because when we have hit a barrier at a certain level with either a vendor or a service coordinator, it's not because those people don't want to partner with us. It's because they don't know. Um, and so often we will end up communicating with our friends in other at the regional or state level and then getting asking them to communicate with us so that we can partner well. Mm -hmm. But keep the lines of communication open with yes. your DDS. Um, you have to yeah. be the one who initiates yeah. and you have to be the one that actively documents um, because they are carrying too many people and often there's, um, again, mixed messages or mixed understandings. So documenting and, is key. Definitely. And again, um, you know, I, I think as um, families, we're, we're directed to go to our service coordinators of our loved ones or, you know, our loved ones go to the service coordinators. And I have always had great relationships with the ones that Craig has had. But unfortunately, they are usually the last ones to find out information. Mm -hmm of the state programs. So don't just rely on them to mm -hmm. information to, um, because very often um, they don't know and they're, they're you know, very, very limited in the, the information they have. It comes from higher ups. But it's <laughs> well, or the flexibility comes from higher ups. They yes. can't be flexible. They are told no. this is, these this are the, is it. 
yes. right? And that's not true. That That is, no. is not true with BDS. But if you can't, if you don't have relationships with you know, area directors, regional directors, and central office people, it, it the, the, you can get stuck in the rigidity of the mm -hmm. system. I, I mean, I will say, uh, Sandy, I'm guaranteeing you that your service coordinators like you better than they like me. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I it's been, it's been a trial. <laughs> I got one taken away from me. Her and I were really close in, in the area office didn't like it. <laughs> um, so I guess, you know, it's, it's past uh, three o'clock and um, this is our last uh, concluding um, webinar in the series. So I guess it's appropriate before we say bye-bye uh, to ask you guys for any parting thoughts um, to share with parents about, um, you know, person-centered planning, living arrangements, and then we say bye-bye. <laughs> I think one of the things that I would leave at is, um, I think that due to this COVID, as Laurel just hinted to a little bit, there is flexibility and things can be very, very different. Um, there's a, a lot of talk and there's a lot of people looking at making things less congregated, mm -hmm. more individualized. Um, you have to be during COVID, but we want to see that continue. Um, one of the, the biggest concerns I've heard from families in the state is if their loved one were in a group home, which is a congregate setting um, of, it could be, you know, anywhere from three to five people usually in the home. It's not choice. They're put into an open bed. Um, and how so many of those people ended up being infected with COVID. Mm -hmm. And it, one, because they're in congregate settings. Um, two, that, you know, the, the staff aren't usually just assigned to that one house. If they're in an agency, they're, they're assigned to numerous houses or numerous facilities. Um, and, you know, part of what we're hearing more and more and we're advocating for is to have more things individualized rather than going back to the same old, same old congregate living, congregate day programs, congregate all kinds of things. Not to say that people don't want to be with others. You know, my son doesn't want to, he does not prefer being with large groups of people uh, with disabilities. He doesn't enjoy it. He doesn't want to be around it. He has a roommate who has a disability and, he, and that's good for him. He has a neighbor who has a disability. That's okay. Um, but we really have to look at people as individuals and not all should go back into that setting nor is it healthy in a lot of ways either. That's what I learned a lot about. And Laurel? Um, you know, I, I think that what I've heard from people is that um, there's, there are opportunities for those who can persist and take advantage of them. I think that one of the most important things is to be clear about what you want. You know, I, I think it, for as a family member um, uh, who has who has uh, two children who struggle with different kind of profiles that can impact availability for working and living, um, it's just really important to be specific and clear about what you need. I need not I need respite, but I need someone from four to seven on Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays, you know, or even if it's an alter, it doesn't have to be a specific schedule, but to say, this is exactly what I need, this number of hours, this kind of person, someone who will do or can do this or that, um, and think about all the details, because the more you can ask specifically, the more likely you're, get, you're to get a yes. Thank you. Good advice. And uh, I guess that concludes it. I did um, post a link to our survey. Um, would be great if you guys, I'm going to just put that in again. Uh, just, it'll take a few seconds. Just um, if you can just give us your feedback on this one. It is a concluding webinar, but it would still be helpful for us um, just for future reference. And I appreciate um, Laurel and Sandy for being our Thank second you. 
thank you for coming and thank you for being so generous with your time and thank you all for coming to this uh, webinar and sharing this one hour plus with us and uh, enjoy the summer and I wish you continued safety and good health, all of you for your families. So thank you.